Check out Sonal Sound System Archive for new music, artist interviews, guest DJ sets, and original Sonos radio shows. Listen to past episodes on demand anywhere from mixcloud.com slash Sonos and the Mixcloud app. Where conversation meets music. This is Take Two. Hey everyone, you're listening to Take Two with me, Tone Blakesley. Today, I'm joined by a world-famous drummer who's played with almost everybody in the world of prog, the one and only Dr. Bill Bruford. As well as Yes, Bill has played with a multitude of bands ranging from rock bands like King Crimson to Canterbury scene band National Health, as well as his own jazz projects Bruford and Earthworks. And as well as being inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame with Yes in 2017, Bill now examines performance psychology and creativity, having gained his doctorate from the University of Surrey. So welcome, Dr. Bill Bruford, to Take Two. Hello, Tone. Thank you very much for having me. You're welcome, Bill. I'd like to start by asking you about how you became interested in music, and was music an important part of your life when you were at school? Very much so, yeah. I had an influential older sister who was great. And everything she did, I thought was cool. So she liked Elvis Presley. I liked Elvis Presley. And all the music of the era when I was young, which would be the late 50s and early 60s, Mm. I loved it all. I thought it was tremendous. And uh, my parents were very keen dancers. And I was kind of the DJ for their dancing. So I put on whatever records I wanted, which is usually Frank Sinatra or something like that. And thoroughly enjoyed music from about the age of 11 or so. Eventually, I went off to boarding school and uh, were a good music teacher there, quite a good music school. Oh, yeah. And a jazz group. Jazz group. Yeah, that was kind of performing in the house that I was at, a boarding school. And uh, they were very good. Older boys. It was 17 or 18, you know, or that kind of age. Yeah. And I was 13 or 14, and the drummer was leaving the school. And I'd expressed an interest in drums, and, and, and he showed me how to play basic swing jazz. Oh, yeah. And kind of said, I'm leaving now. You've got the gig. Did he kind of influence you to become interested in jazz and drumming in jazz music? Yeah, I gravitated towards jazz, first of all. And the Beatles came and kind of listened, and we thought that was cool, but not as exciting as jazz. The Rolling Stones came, we thought that was all right, but not as exciting as jazz. So everything was measured against jazz, which we thought was tremendous. And I loved it, and of course... Jazz drumming is a a very high expression of the drum kit art, so it was a good place to start listening. So as you became more proficient in drumming, how did major drummers who were performing in these big sort of jazz bands come to influence you? Well, maybe through the classic BBC TV, Ah. because jazz was pretty big, and I think prime time 6 30 on a saturday evening you could hear the best american jazz artists live in a studio beautifully recorded sounded terrific in front of a seated audience and that's what i heard unlike today where you'd hear the x factor type programs are today we were just hearing american jazz musicians so i listened to that and thought that is tremendous how do they do that Hmm. it was a mystery After you left boarding school, you played in several small groups before joining a particular group called Mabel Greer's Toy Shop, (laughs) which was the precursor to Yes. What were these groups like and how did you come to join Mabel Greer's Toy Shop? Well, it was a very short period of time. I mean, I always do everything on January the 1st. So I decided on January the 1st, 1968, I'd be a musician. Seemed like a great idea at the time. And I went for an audition on about the 16th of January, I think, up in London. I was from Kent, Seven Oaks. And got a job with a Savoy Brown blues band, which seemed pretty good. And that lasted for about three nights. Fifteen pounds I made, a fiver a night. But then they dismissed me, for, I think, for fiddling about with the rhythm too much, probably, oh. in their blues band. And I did a few other strange one-off things that I don't really remember until I did bump into the beginnings of Yes uh, about that summer. So it was only a few months. So, so I'd really played with almost nobody, is what I'm saying. How did Mabel Greer develop into Yes? Well, I'm not even sure. I mean, it was a blurred few weeks. You know, there was a group that was failing, not doing very well. There was other guys wanted to move on to a new group. People were joining and leaving. I think Peter Banks joined fairly quickly. He was an early member of Yes, and I think it was his idea to call the band that name, Yes. So one group kind of metamorphosed into another quite easily. It was happening a lot in 1968. So it was a fast-moving scene. And of course, it was the start of the progressive rock scene, the late 60s, where you got these bands beginning to play more ambitious tunes, which had rhythms which would catch the listener's ear. 
I was wondering about your contributions towards that sound and the band sound. Progressive rock was so cool because it was just bringing in components from all kinds of other aspects of life that weren't necessarily associated with rock or pop music at the time. Some aspects of which were rhythmic. Mm. So if you like, I bought a jazz flavour, except that we didn't play jazz in any way, shape or form, and I was the only guy who knew anything about it. Right. But we did favour longer compositions. We started as a covers band. The great advantage to playing covers is that you can arrange or rearrange a cover song so that it shows your own particular strengths, your own world view, your own view of how music should go. So when we covered, for example, Something's Coming by Leonard Bernstein, we did a different arrangement which played to our strengths and imposed ourselves on that cover song, which is so people can say, oh, it used to sound like that. Now this band, yes, who we don't anything about they do it like this mm. i always recommend covers as a great way to start in the music industry but not just playing an exact replica i don't really recommend the tribute band thing i recommend taking the cover and expanding on it creating with it so we started doing that and then before you know it you know you're playing the last section first and you're playing the middle section upside down and you're playing the end section you know half as fast as the beginning section and you're, you're starting to write a, a more involved composition in progressive rock I quite like the covers that you did and the band did on the early Yes albums. No Opportunity Necessary by Richie Havens. Um, yeah. They combined that track with the big country yeah, sound. That's right. I thought that was very clever. It went very well together. <laughs> yes, that was part of what we were doing, mixing and mashing. If you like these days, I could talk about mashing, you know, mashing ideas together, squeezing things in, thinking whether would they work or not. But usually at that point, only other people's ideas. What then happened was that we started to write our own ideas completely from beginning to end. So there's yeah. fresh and original music based on some of the things we jammed together and things we thought were good and things we weren't. Well, we'll extend it. And then before you know it, you're writing your own entire composition. And what great compositions Yes did in that time whilst you were a member. One of the tracks of Time in the Word which sticks in my mind is a track called Every Days. I noticed the drumming style that you did with that yeah. before it went full on. Was that sort of jazz influence? Because I listened to some Miles Davies and the opening long continual track has got that same sort of rhythm to it oh yeah i was very much a jazz drummer i thought i was going to be a jazz drummer when i was 18 or 19 i didn't know yes was going to be a rock group i was just hanging about with people in a bar and they said let's form a band so you know i thought it might be a jazz group i didn't know really about rock at all mm. but because progressive rock was so welcoming of outsiders and i felt like an outsider you know you could bring yourself in and join in and try to make something of whatever you had in the room at that moment try to make it better try to contribute to it Six full albums they released whilst you were a member. So which one of these albums do you look back on with the most satisfaction? Close to the Edge, I think, was kind of the killer in the sense that pretty much the band had spent three or four years working towards that. It didn't know it was working towards that, but everything was kind of imperfect until finally the end result of Close to the Edge pretty much encapsulated everything that was good about the band at that time, I thought. So it took two or three years to get there. It's also one of my favourite albums. There's so much emotion in that track mm. because of the different <clears throat> sort of pieces and suites there are in it. So what was composing this epic like? Must have taken a long time. No, uh, it, it took a very long time. And it was a very fragmented kind of process involving tape editing yeah. a lot. So typically we'd have a good 16 bar section and we'd record that. And then we'd scratch our heads and sit around in the studio and think, well, what should we play next? And then somebody would say, how about this idea? And then that would get edited onto that idea. And this monster was being created before our eyes and yeah. ears, but we didn't really know where it was going. So we had the chest and a couple of legs, sort of a Frankenstein. And eventually we built this thing together. And out of really more luck than design, it happened to work out okay. It came out brilliantly. I mean, it's one of the best compositions out there. John Anderson and Steve Howe had a lot of input. So what were your inputs into that process? I think maybe I was more of an irritant or a provocateur, perhaps. Really? I would probably say that's a good thing. In oh. creativity studies, that's a good thing. Yeah. It's like the grit in an oyster shell. It forces things to become stronger. It enhances the pearl inside. So I was always saying, 
you know, we could do better than this, or why don't we do it this way? Or I quite like that, the idea that you've got going, but it's, it gets really dull after five seconds, so why don't we transpose it, or something. I was one of those kind of people on drummers tend to because I didn't have a melodic instrument in my hands. So you're saying, well, you know that theme you had 10 minutes ago? It was really much better than this one. So why don't we put that theme in 3-4 and superimpose it on that one? Yeah. So I was, in a way, was standing back, I think, and watching the architecture of the thing, of the building being built uh-huh. in front of me. Your first solo composition, 5% for Nothing, yeah. which is on Fragile. Mm. Can you tell me about that track? I, I can. Well, you, you had to put it in the context of the making of the album which was, on the whole, we didn't have much music. So we had an album to make, which was about 40 minutes, only 40 minutes, of course, because that's all a vinyl album could take. These days, if an, if, if an album is less than an hour and 10 minutes, people want their money back. We had probably only had about 20 minutes worth of music. So we recorded that, and nobody knew what to play next kind of thing. So I think it was I who suggested the idea, because well, we couldn't agree, really, on how the thing should progress. Should all five instrumentalists play all the time on everything? That's always a problem with rock music. Or maybe not. So how about if you, Chris Squire, take the band Yes as your own personal orchestra for a song? You, John Anderson, take the band Yes as your own personal orchestra for a song. Do it exactly the way you want. We will be your orchestral musicians. So that was a way of looking, trying to get out of a creative cul-de-sac, an artistic kind of dead end. Mm. unfortunately it didn't really work out a lot of people just did solo tracks so Steve Howe just said okay well I'll just play on my own yeah. so he played guitar played a song called A Clap I think or move, for a day. Uh, move for a Day Okay. and um, I said well that's one way of doing it but that's not really what I had in mind you know I meant using everybody in the band but then of course I didn't use a voice on 5% for nothing John Anderson used everybody so it was like a John Anderson song with him using all the members of Yes exactly as he instructed it was kind of a mess but the album had two or three other great songs on it. Heart of the Sunrise, maybe. And, that was good. And Roundabout, maybe. Yeah. So the album got off the ground, but that idea of mine was poorly realised. I, I thought it was a good 36 seconds, though. <laughs> it was a very enjoyable 36 seconds, but if you blink, you miss it. And the reason it's so short is because being an amateur, I had no idea how to extend music. I didn't realise you could play the thing backwards and upside down and then you'd immediately double its length or treble its length. There are simple rules to how you extend music, but I hadn't been to music school. But nevertheless, great track. As well as being a member of Yes, you've also featured on many of the solo albums of the other Yes members. Chris Squire on his Fish Out of Water album, Mm. Steve Howe on some of his acoustic albums, Patrick Moraz, you did a duo with him. Did you enjoy these albums, and was working with these members individually much easier than in the band? The second question's spot on. The first question is, yes, I enjoyed it more, but the second question is, I enjoyed it more because it was easier. And the reason it's easier is because you're doing what you're told. And if somebody says, here's the music, this is what I want you to do, it begins here and it ends here, and we're not co-constructing the piece of music, Mm. that's so much easier than all sitting around together like this. So did I enjoy it? Yes, certainly I enjoyed it. And I enjoyed it because it was easier. I think the music sort of reflects that ease because it flows quite well. So you left Yes in 1972 to join King Crimson. I did. Was that a difficult decision? Oh, no, I don't think so. I'd been kind of stalking King Crimson for quite a long time. I loved King Crimson. Everybody did. Yeah. And they, at the time, had a huge hit record, whereas Yes didn't. So King Crimson was the more famous group at the time, certainly in the UK. And everybody thought they were astonishingly good. And I thought, oh, I'd really like to play with somebody else. I'm getting tired of all this sitting around with Yes. Everything takes so long. King Crimson seemed like a darker, kind of more improvised place to be. And I I really wanted to learn a bit more about myself and how music works. If you only play with four people the entire time, then that's all you ever get any good at. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. If you join a band at the age of 18 and you finish with it at age 60, you've only ever heard yourself play with four other people or three other people, and it's boring. Uh, so I wanted to change. Not, no, it wasn't a difficult uh, move at all. So what did King Crimson offer to you that Yes didn't? Different people, different way of making music, different yeah. way of thinking of things. Traditionally, people lump the progressive rock groups like Genesis and Yes and King Crimson and UK, the the four that I've been in, they lump them all together as being the same thing. In fact, King Crimson and Yes were chalk and cheese. Yeah, very different. Very different. One had a a, a sunny kind of disposition, you know, A major diatonic harmony, big vocal approach being Yes. And the other was a darker minor key kind of whole tone kind of chordal sound to it that was much more 
to do with the tradition of European improvisation than it was to do with anything American. Quite different places to work. Later on in 1976, as one of the bands that you mentioned, Genesis, were very energetic in the concert I watched. Did you enjoy drumming with Phil Collins? Yes, uh, a lot. Phil's a tremendous drummer, very good, very funny. Again, I had no responsibility, so it's quite easy in the sense that all you have to do is what the song is. I wasn't creating material. They were very particular about the way they wanted things done, which was okay with me. So I was effectively a session musician, a hired gun, as they'd say, for that particular band. And I didn't mind that for a year or so. But after that, I really wanted to form my own band. Which you did, Bruford. Yeah. And you released an album, Feels Good To Me. Mm -hmm. Certainly felt very good to me, that album. Was this instrumental prog rock, jazz rock, jazz fusion? Well, it was all those things. And albums, they don't fit into categories quite okay. so easily. If it's about anything at all, it's my own development as a musician. Yeah. So clearly I'm going to bring some progressive rock aspects over from progressive rock. Yeah. But I grew up as a jazz musician and I was finding my way back to jazz. I mean, I've been on a long detour. I thought, remember as a kid, and it's very formative, music you hear from 13 to 18 is the stuff you're going to enjoy the whole of your life. And I was finding my way back, although I didn't know it, back towards jazz mm. uh, with some very wonderful musicians, just Kenny Wheeler and Alan Holdsworth and Annette Peacock. And these are, these are effectively jazz musicians. Although I think we thought we were playing a fancy kind of electric rock with advanced harmony. So yeah. it had lots of fancy chords in it. Yeah. The opening track of that album, Beelzebub, mm. um, I enjoyed it because of its constantly changing rhythms mm. intertwined with the suddenness of the other instruments going along with your drumming so neatly. Mm -hmm. um, was that one of your favourites? It was. Uh, it is one of my favourites, I think, actually. I particularly like the, you know what a bridge is? It's the middle section oh, yes, of the yeah. music. It's got a very legato bridge in a very complicated time signature, but ended either side by a very staccato kind of verse. Mm. It worked really well, I think, and Alan Holdsworth on it is just beautiful. You, of course, played the guitar mm. on that album. Mm. This was followed by One of a Kind. How did it differ at all from Feels Good to well, Me? Well, we were been touring a lot by now. And Feels Good to Me was a studio album. So you can have a flugelhorn player. You can have a singer who you might use for two songs. You can have uh, somebody doing cello over there, you know, yeah. for another song. But on tour, that's much harder because you can't have all those pieces too expensive to carry all those people around the world. Yeah. Uh, so it's better to have a touring band of four people. And so the album, One of a Kind, was cut with those four people in mind, yeah. specifically about those four people. It only contained those four people. Do you see what I mean? So that becomes a particular sound in itself. So the band was refining what it did. And One of a Kind, I think, was, you know, close to the edge, as it were, for that particular band. Into the 80s now, you went back to King Crimson for your second spell. Then your next jazz project was a band called Earthworks. What was the idea behind Earthworks? Well, same idea as ever, really. There have been some continuing themes throughout what it is I've tried to do, one of which is yeah. to do something fresh on the drums. In a way, you must bear in mind that my approach is I'm more interested in percussion and drumming than I am in rock or jazz. I really care about rock or jazz. What I care about is are the drums doing something interesting? Right. I think my obligation, my job, what you're paying me for is to imagine the future on a drum kit. So if somebody's going to invent electronic drums, I'm going to run with that and see what they do. Are they any good? I'm like a test pilot for ideas and rhythms and what people will live with, what works in music. And Earthworks was set up as a jazz group, but using electronic drums that are played very physically, flesh and blood. So you must understand that when the word electronic is used, it doesn't always mean programmed. The sound source is electronic, or electronic derivation, but the playing, the accessing of that source, is very much real-time flesh and blood. Simple distinction, you, which you can get, I understand you get that immediately, mm. but a lot of your listeners will find that they don't really understand that, that you play electronic drums rather than just program them. What sort of difference is there between electronic and acoustic drums? Many, many differences. One of the chief limitations of electronic drums is they have very little headroom. In comparison to an acoustic drum, which is an enormous headroom from very, very quiet to absolutely deafening, an electronic drum has like 128 divisions of MIDI attached oh. to it. So it can go from quite quiet like this to quite loud like that, but it's got a very minimal headroom. Yes. So you're always, when you're playing with other people with acoustic instruments, you're always playing too quiet or too loud. Very hard to control 
But you must bear in mind, this is now the 1980s or 1990s, mm. when electronic drums were at their infancy. They may well be much better now. But as at the start, they were, they were a poor kind of instrument. But they had certain things they could do very well, which is not be like a facsimile of drums. So the manufacturer had said, look, use these electronic drums. You'll get the same sound every night. It'll be fantastic. Uh, and they'll sound just like drums. And I said, like so many musicians do, but what if we don't make them sound like drums? What if we make them sound like something else, but play them rhythmically? Aha! Much more interesting. And I noticed some of that in the Earthworks albums. Yeah. After that first part of Earthworks in the 80s, yeah. ABWH, yeah. And then you came back um, with King Crimson. We did. Yes, in the mid-90s, we had a King Crimson again. Fantastic. But this was now a bigger King Crimson. Now there was a double trio, oh, as yeah. it were. That is two drummers, two bass players, two guitarists, was the thinking of that. Again, I think a little bit like my suggestions for Fragile, I think it was a poorly realized idea. On paper, the idea sounds great. What if we have two of everything? We can have two trios playing at the same time. In fact, we didn't. The best duo out of those three duos were the drummers, who we really did work hard and, and interact mm. and play a kind of drumming that you couldn't have got with just one guy at all. It doesn't matter, though. You know, failure is every bit as good as success, mm. as long as you understand what you're learning from the failure. That's fine. So, you know, people have described the band leader, Robert Fripp, as a guy who just throws balls in the air and his fellow bandmates catch some, let some drop. It doesn't matter. Um, but the ones that you catch, you want to do something with if you can. Moving on now to your jazz performances in Earthworks 2. Do you improvise a lot in your jazz performances? Oh, yeah. I don't think you could call it a jazz performance if it didn't have any improvisation. Put it the other way around. If it's got some improvisation, I think you've got to call it a jazz performance. Uh, but the quality and type of improvisation is important. Mm. And yes, we improvised like crazy over some very complicated little heads, as they call them. That's the, the front part of the thematic material upon which you are about to improvise. We had some quite complicated music, and I was very privileged to have Gwilym Simcock and Tim Garland towards the end of Earthworks. Two of uh, this country's finest musicians, Tim and Gwil, are just tremendous. So it was a wonderful band for sure, uh, and I ran that until about 2008, 2009, somewhere. I enjoyed the 2003, I think it was, live performance. I enjoyed listening to that. Great. Got a lot of jazz in it. I quite like jazz. Um, I was listening to jazz long before I was listening to Yes. Hmm. So do you think you've taken Yes fans into jazz? Well, I, hard to say. Hard to say. I don't really know, and, and uh, I have no statistics to, to prove that, you know, but a lot of my, on my daily sort of emails and Facebook, a lot of people said, oh, I never heard about that, or I love this new thing, Earthworks, or whatever. So a lot of people are very complimentary about it. But jazz has got a terrible reputation, awful reputation, and, and most people just can't be doing with it at all. They think it's self-indulgent half the time. I think it's more than that. So do I. I see a lot in jazz more than I see in prog rock because it goes to more yeah. places. Coming back to Yes, currently there are two incarnations oh. of Yes. There's a recently renamed Yes featuring John Anderson, Trevor Rabin, Rick Wakeman, and Yes itself. Do you think they both represent the Yes sound? I haven't the slightest idea. Okay. I don't know anything about it, and bear in mind I retired in 2009, so say eight years ago or something. So I have no interest in Yes now. Um, so whether one is a better group or the other, I have no idea at all. I mean, I enjoyed Yes a lot half a century ago, you know, but uh, things have changed. I'm uh, an academic now. I, I no longer perform on the drums. Okay. I stopped when I was 60, so that was about eight years ago, and I'm perfectly happy with that. But, but what Yes does or does not do now doesn't really interest me, mostly because I, it seems rather repetitive that they're basically doing the same thing, you know, that they've done yeah. for many years. And I would find that a bit tedious myself. Yes, we're recently inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. How do you feel about this induction? I'm a bit split. Uh, on the one, one hand, I'm told it's a huge honour. On the other, I'm wondering who are these people honouring me? Uh, and these people seem to be uh, a group of Americans who have abrogated unto themselves the definition of what rock music is and what it is not. I may or may not agree with that. I mean, I'm thrilled that they seem to like Yes, that's really nice, and I've mm. got a jolly nice statuette. But I've not been really one for awards, mm. and I'm not terribly interested in what you think of me. 
I'm more interested in whether I'm entertaining myself or not. <laughs> Yeah. and doing something, producing something on a drum kit. Whether a group of Americans based largely on a Rolling Stone magazine think that yes is or is not rock music mm. and decides to give us a prize is not really my, my concern. Mm. However, I did go and it was jolly nice of them and everybody applauded and I'm thrilled. And finally, are you doing anything musically now since your retirement? Rather depends what you call musically. Does it involve a musical instrument? No, but I, I recently have... A doctorate in musicology, really, yeah. or the psychology of music. Yeah, I heard about that. And I'm writing a book which is just about creativity yeah. and drummers. And that's been a fascinating process, learning about the psychology of music performance and creativity and how that works. I had the privilege to interview, like you, interview yeah. nine expert drummers in a a researcher way, a proper academic way, and analyse their responses and interpret their responses and get a book from that. So that's what has been occupying me over the last uh, seven years, really. Well done on your doctorate. Thank you very much. How kind of you. Yes. <laughs> so that was Bill Bruford, or so I say Dr. Bill Bruford. That'll do. Um, I like that. Thank you, Bill, for coming on to the programme. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. An absolute legend there. Dr. Bill Bruford on Take Two. And you can check out Bill's latest book, Uncharted, Creativity and the Expert Drummer, by visiting his website, billbruford.com. And I hope you can join me again at the same time next week for a conversation from the archives with naturalist and Springwatch presenter Gillian Burke, when Take Two will be continued. You're listening to Take Two on CSRFM.